So Lynn Bauer is our guest artist. Uh, Lynn lives in Oregon, I think fairly close to the coast, in a very nice uh, setting. Uh, but she actually uh, used to live in Minnesota. Uh, and uh, she comes from a mathematical background. She, is a, uh, she has a PhD in mathematics from the University of Kansas, and then went on to teach mathematics at, uh, as a professor at Carleton College. But um, I think she wanted to go back to her childhood absorption um, and, and, and sort of the less stress with uh, her using her prior training in art. So uh, she's very much active in the healing arts. She's gonna talk about, uh, I, as I said before, uh, eliminating fear in watercolor painting, particularly with postcard painting, postcards and smaller works, but she has done larger works and some of those are on, on the walls of several uh, prominent healthcare facilities in the Twin Cities. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Lynn and Lynn's gonna have a brief, uh, either one or two brief videos and she will also do a couple of demos as well. So Lynn. All right, thank you. I'm just gonna switch the spotlight here. So I'm on camera. So um, I, wanna, I wanna thank you all for inviting me to come back home for the evening. Um, even though it's just virtually, I, I wish I could see everybody. I wish I were in person so that I could look out and see familiar faces. So I'm just gonna use my imagination. And I know that there are gonna be some old friends that I haven't seen for a while and people whose art I've admired for years out there. And, probably some new friends. And I hope that um, there will be something for everyone in this presentation, whether you started painting watercolor yesterday or you've been painting uh, 50 years. So Art was talking about the issue of fear. And um, actually uh, what, I, what I most want to share with you is um, more about motivation, I guess, because motivation can overcome fear. And, um, I, I have painted postcards, watercolor postcards for many, many years, but last year as a result of COVID, um, and I'll tell you more about that story in a moment, I, I sort of focused for a while in my teaching on uh, postcards and it was supposed to be kind of a lark and it turned into something more than that. And I learned some interesting things having conversations with literally thousands of people who are painting watercolor postcards while they're stuck at home during COVID. So I wanna share with you some of the insights that I got from all those conversations and also some of the things that it taught me um, or helped me refine in terms of the strategies that I use to give myself a better shot at being successful painting po postcards. Because you know we all love this idea of taking watercolor with us everywhere we go and using it to you know, enhance and record our travels or what's going on in our lives. But uh, I, I, I think I'm not alone in saying that, um, you know, I always imagine that I'm gonna paint more when I'm traveling than I actually get, get, get around to painting. I, I manage, imagine that I'm gonna paint more than I actually get around to painting in, in when I'm at home too. And I think some of the lessons that I learned from all these conversations and from trying to create these postcard videos um, are, are worth considering, even if you aren't all that interested in painting postcards, I think they apply uh, generally. But I think uh, if you haven't done a lot of postcard painting, I'm hoping that some of what I present tonight will give you the confidence and, and motivation to give it a shot. And if you've tried it in the past and it didn't go so well, maybe it'll go a little better um, with some of these ideas. And if you have done a lot of plein air painting, a lot of postcards, and you're like, you've got your system down, I'm not here to try to change how you're doing things, but I think that um, you might still be interested in hearing kind of what I learned from talking to all these thousands of people who were doing um, postcard paint alongs with me on YouTube during the past year. So um, I wanna start off by sort of setting the scene in uh, May of 2019, I packed up all my art supplies and me and all my stuff and I took off to uh, live and work and teach Zoom classes from my 19 and a half foot camper van, which I called the tiny escape. 
And whenever I talk about uh, these travels, the first series of questions that I always get is like, what was it like to do that? And a lot of people have the same kind of uh, dream of going off and doing that as I did. So um, I've, I've made a little about three or four minute video to give you an opportunity to kind of experience in a little nutshell montage uh, what it was like on that trip up and down the entire West Coast, all the way from here to Anchorage, Alaska, and then back down to Southern California. I eventually went all the way across the country too, but the video only covers the West Coast side of it. Um, and it's just a quick little video to kind of give you an idea of what that was like. And also to sort of help fill your, your mind with some ideas about the kinds of things that you see when you're traveling and you want to paint postcards and then we'll address some of those. So um, give me just a moment here. I'm going to share my screen and share this little video with you. All right. So sit back and relax.
So um, I hope that everybody's blood pressure has gone down now and, um, and you enjoyed that little uh, quick view. And uh, there I was at the end of that video, um, actually took a, took a trip across the country and I was in Florida last March uh, on my way up to spend the summer in Minnesota, Wisconsin, teaching some workshops and um, hanging out with friends and visiting favorite uh, painting spots and, and favorite friends when we all know what happened. So um, I had been teaching Zoom classes from my van uh, using my cell uh, data plan whenever I had a strong enough signal. And when COVID hit and all the campgrounds <laughs> just shut down <laughs> and all the state parks where I had reservations for the next two and a half months just canceled, um, I wound up uh, in Wisconsin on a friend's farm sheltering in place with uh, basically no cell signal, uh, not really much available. And my students, uh, all those students I have been working with had been working on um, things like trying to develop a more personal style and trying to really dig deep and do authentic work. And we all were finding that our brains were just mush. And so, so everything kind of got interrupted like all the rest of the world. And I was trying to figure out what do I do for my students to kind of help them through this, uh, this stressful period. And a lot of people were saying, I wanna be in studio painting. And I know that it would probably help me to be in studio painting. Um, but when I get in there, I just really can't think. And I'm, I'm so stressed, I, I don't know what to do. So I, I had just, um, <laughs> so just to give you an idea of what I had to work with, let me uh, quickly change my, there we go. So this is the video setup I normally have at home. <laughs> and, and this is what I had available to me in the van. So I thought, okay, well, I could make videos of postcards. I could do that much. And as you saw in the little montage there, I had been painting postcards and also some even smaller paintings while I was traveling. So I thought, well, there's something we could do together that, you know, maybe it's not what we had been working on, but it would help us all relax. Um, we could de-stress a little bit and I'll put them up on YouTube and my students can watch them there. And at least we'll keep our brushes moving and at least we'll keep our watercolor skills up, those things that we all have to practice, our brush handling, dealing with you know, wet and wet and water content and all of that, you know, the stuff that you get rusty on if you don't paint. So um, when, I, when I started to do this, I thought, you know, I don't want, everyone's stressed. I don't want to think about it too hard. I don't want them to have to think about it too hard. So I'm going to keep these videos simple. And um, I decided that what I would do is try to make them so that even a complete beginner could do it. You didn't have to think very much about it but you had a pretty good chance of succeeding. And then for the people who've been painting a while, I tried to have in each one, maybe one little kind of handy trick that you might use that I discovered that worked well for postcards. So I was trying to hit both audiences. And um, so I put them up on YouTube and um, it exploded basically. So my YouTube channel prior to last March was basically a little repository where I could stick videos um, for my students to use after a class or a workshop to review. And I had maybe 3000 subscribers and they were almost all people that had either taken a class with me or a friend of somebody who had taken a class with me. And so, you know, I, I wasn't trying to use YouTube as part of my business. And that was in March. And by the end of June, I had something like 30,000 subscribers. And it was just, I, I was inundated. I had um, every week I had thousands of email messages from people who were watching these postcard videos saying how they were having such a great time with them and it was really helping them with the stress of COVID. And uh, would I please make more faster, <laughs> quicker, and, and also asking a million questions. And by October, it actually got to the point where I kind of had to push pause on it for a while because I was sort of overwhelmed. And I also had a full schedule of Zoom classes scheduled for the winter. So I haven't been making the postcard videos, although I will be going back to them. But over the winter, I had a chance to kind of go back and reread and um, carry on some email conversations with some of the people that had written to me. And so I wanna share with you what I learned in the process of trying to make these postcards manageable 
for beginners, what it taught me about um, my own making postcards for myself in the field and just my art practice in general. And also what I learned from having conversations with all of these people about um, why this was such a big, you know, uh, a, a thing. <laughs> How come so many people all of a sudden were watching these videos and, you know, just ravenous for more. Um, so I, I want to sort of lead off with what the big takeaways were. And then I'm going to get into the nitty gritty of, of applying this. So, so the big takeaways from talking to all these people were, first of all, um, it was the right amount of challenge for the moment. And it made me think about how we often don't allow ourselves that in our own art practice. It's kind of like every painting's got to be better than the one that we painted before. We got to show constant improvement. We got to keep challenging ourselves, which is great. But there are times when you know life is stressful and you don't have the um, the wherewithal to really focus like that on something more challenging, and. And if you don't allow yourself the opportunity to back off a little bit and do something a little less challenging, then your painting practice can't be part of your stress relief. And when we all start out, we're kind of like, whatever happens, and we allow ourselves to go in the studio and play. And then later, we put a lot more pressure on ourselves. So I heard from a lot of people who hadn't painted for a long time or who were finding new enthusiasm for their painting because they were doing these silly little postcard paint-alongs. And the reason was it was the right amount of stress, the right amount of demand for the mental bandwidth that they had at that moment in time. And I thought, you know, we should all do that for ourselves more and more consciously. The next big takeaway was that connection was a big reason why people got excited and got motivated. So over and over people said, you know, normally I try to get in the studio to paint and I, you know, there's always something else I feel like I have to do. But the idea that I was going to mail this to a friend who was having a tough time or mail this to my mother who's in a nursing home and can't have visitors or my grandkids that I can't hug, that was hugely motivated. It made, motivating. It made me very excited to get back in the studio. And that's another thing that we sometimes don't give ourselves when we're just working on our work and trying to get better as painters. You know, we might be painting trying to impress the judge at the next show or, you know, trying to sell something. But we rarely have this very particular specific person that we care a lot about that we're making this painting for. Sometimes, but not, not all the time. And so a postcard becomes kind of like the art equivalent of a text message. You can do it pretty quick and you can share something fairly simple about your day that's going to make uh, somebody you care about smile or feel cared for or loved. And, um, and and so it's easy to motivate yourself to sit down and paint a little postcard for your grandkids, you know, or your, your mother-in-law or whoever it might be. So that connection, and if it's not connection to the outer world, connection to our own feelings, connection to the beauty around us, all those things are important parts of our art and important parts of why we wanted to make it in the first place. And sometimes we get so concerned with, you know, trying to make ourselves better and trying to be motivated that we forget all that and we lose that motivation. And so for the people who were coming back to art um, after a, a break, they almost all said, it really made a huge difference for me that I was painting this for somebody else, somebody particular. And I knew that they were gonna, you know, I was painting something I knew they were gonna be happy to get, uh, excited about a topic that connected to them or just the fact that they were gonna get physical mail in their hands was gonna excite them. And that made a big difference and I was able to get myself motivated. Um, another th big takeaway was that focus, having a single purpose for that little painting was key to success. So the postcard paint alongs that did the best that people um, understood and got the most out of were the ones where it was very clear what we were trying to do. We didn't try to cram too much stuff into that one painting. We had a pretty clear focus for that painting. And that's another thing that, especially when we're traveling, we don't do very well. You know, we're like, oh my gosh, there's so much stuff here and I got to cram it all into one painting. And a postcard helps with that because there's really just <laughs> practically just so much you can cram into a four by six 
you know, rectangle. So it kind of forces you to do the simplification and editing. And I think it's good for all of us in terms of like training our eye for design um, to, to have that single limited focus. And then for me, it reminded me of the beauty of a simple thing done with care. Um, a lot of times we're like, going to do the more complicated painting and the next more complicated painting and the next more complicated painting. And we kind of forget that for many of us, the reason that we chose watercolor as a medium is the cool things that watercolor will do. And you can take a very simple subject and use it to showcase something cool that watercolor will do and make a lovely little painting without having to, you know, throw in all the bells and whistles and be super comp complicated. So I tried to take those four takeaways back into the rest of my art making. And it really was kind of a nice reset. It kind of reminded me that, oh yeah, you know, uh, we do this for, for how it feeds our soul, not, you know, because it's a self-improvement program necessarily. I mean, it's great to keep working on your skills and honing your skills, but when life is rough, when you're having a tough time in your life, then it's also great to be able to draw nourishment from your art. And that requires going back to those things that made you fall in love with it in the first place. So all of these people who were responding so much to these postcards, a lot of it had to do with, you know, that simple basic thing that allowed them to connect with themselves and connect with others um, and had the right amount of stress to keep them interested, but not so much that it was overwhelming and too much of a chore to add on top. So um, what, what keeps us from doing that all the time? Well, uh, part of that is too much weight. Um, and by too much weight, part of that is too much stuff that we drag to the field. So if specifically when we're talking about going to do things like postcards or travel sketching or small plein air paintings, we have this fantasy person who I think has Sherpas back there that are gonna bring all that stuff that we normally use in the studio. We don't wanna let go of any of that, you know? And, and so it's a big production to go to the field. Now, people who manage to get to the point um, where they do a lot of plein air painting, figure out what's their system and what are they gonna take and they, what are they gonna leave behind? They don't take their whole studio to the field. But especially at the beginning, you kind of don't know what to take, what not to take. And a lot of people, most of us, take way too much stuff. We also put too much weight on this piece of paper in general. Like this painting, every painting I start, has got to be fabulous. And I got to find the perfect subject. And I got to figure out how to paint everything so that it will be appealing to everyone and anyone, not a particular person. So bringing it down to a postcard and taking some of that weight off, so many people told me it helped them so much to be able to say to themselves, hey, it's just a postcard. If it doesn't turn out, it's just a postcard. I didn't use much time or materials to make it. I can flip it over and paint on the back if I want to. Um, and, and that also, um, I think, is an attitude that we could well bring into the rest of our painting and, and benefit from is, you know, it's a piece of paper. Um, it's easy to do a lot of versions of a postcard, so that helped people be exploratory. So, um, so I'm going to just let you think about how much weight you put on psychologically, and I'm going to talk just briefly about the physical weight and talk about what I take to the field, um, because I know there are always questions about, like, what, what are your supplies? What are you using? Would you please tell me what colors and all that sort of stuff? So, um, so this is my field kit. Uh, that I take that has everything I need to paint postcards, except the postcards themselves, which I've pulled out. They normally get tucked in here too. And I am not going to go through every little bit of this in this talk, even though I know that already some of you are going, but could you please tell us where you got your palette? You know, um, and the reason why I'm not going to go through it all is I already made that video. So um, when the recording for this gets posted, I've made a handout that lists um, where to find the video where I actually pull out every item that I have in here and explain why it's in here and where to get it and what it is and all that sort of stuff. And then anything that I'm talking about tonight that isn't in here, any products that I don't carry with me to the field, 
um, I've put it on the handout as well. So you don't have to worry about trying to frantically scribble down notes about what was that thing you said you used to protect your postcards in the mail. It'll be on the handout. Um, there are a few other things that are difficult to demonstrate in the time frame we have, and I have links to videos on those things too. So you can relax, sit back, and just enjoy. You don't have to try to worry about writing all that down. But the, the important thing about this is how small it is. This is, um, it's probably about, oh, well, with everything in it, it's probably about four inches wide. It's about six inches tall and about nine inches long. So it drops right down into my backpack. I can carry it around the house. I can throw it in a tote. This is everything I need to paint in the field, except for this is the second piece. And let me just get myself out of the screen here. Um, this is just a plastic cutting board. And the reason why I have this is one thing you want to think about when you're um, doing uh, field work is how, are you, how much can you carry? We just talked about that. And how are you going to use it when you're in the field? How are you going to hold it? <laughs> you know, Are you going to sit down? Are you going to take an easel? And I decided a long time ago that if I have to lug an easel and a big jug of water for bigger paintings and stuff, I'm just not likely to go out that much. So I'm better off with something that's really portable. So this can go on my lap or I have little holes drilled in either corner and I have a strap that I can put on it and sort of sling it over my shoulders and hold it in front of me like a tray and stand up and paint on it. So I don't need to pack an easel. This is very lightweight, has a nice little handle and it has these little dots on it. Those dots are Velcro dots. And the reason for that is when I put my palette on there, I've got little Velcro dots on the back of the palette too. And my little water cup has Velcro dots. So if I'm sitting with this on my lap and I tip it, nothing slides. When I put, um, when I'm ready to paint, and I, I can tape directly to it, but usually I tape to another support, and then I can use a binder clip. So everything, no wind blows stuff away, nothing slides. So I, I'm trying to make it easy on myself, easy, reduce the amount of friction to take it to, to the field. So reduce the weight, reduce the friction, make it simple. Um, and, and that's kind of all I'm going to say. That's more like general advice about what to take to the field. Um, like I said, everything that I have in my pack, I talk about why, what's in there and why I have it. As far as the colors in my palette, I don't list the colors in my palette because they change constantly. I am always auditioning new colors, taking other colors off. I have a base palette of about five to eight colors that are always around and that I address on the handout. So um, I'm gonna let you look at the handout for that too, instead of like trying to list what specific colors I happen to have on there tonight. Um, so, so don't worry, most of the stuff that I'm doing, it doesn't really matter what color, you know, pick the colors that are appealing to you and um, <laughs> you don't need to worry about what I'm uh, using. But the one supply issue I haven't addressed in a previous videos very much that, I, that always comes up that I do wanna talk about is people wanna know, what do you do to protect your postcards as they're going through the mail? So um, my answer to that is uh, nothing. <laughs> I just mail them and I don't worry about it. Uh, unless I get one that's super nice. If I get one that's super nice, what I do with it is a four by six postcard glues onto a five by seven greeting card very nicely with a nice half inch border. So if I get one that's super nice and I wanna protect it, I glue it to a greeting card, I make it for a special occasion and it goes in an envelope. Um, you can also just drop them in an envelope generally. But uh, another alternative is you can use, you can coat your postcard with a cold wax medium like Dorland's wax medium or Golden or Gamblin, one of those. And I'm also not going to demonstrate that because it's super easy. Basically, you're just kind of rubbing it on with your finger. And there are already tons of YouTube videos on how to do that. And, and it's, it's like, there's nothing to it. But um, I don't do this because once you put wax on the surface, it's protected against water and, you know, dirt from people's hands and stuff like that, but you cannot paint over it anymore. 
So what I do instead is I spray mine. If I want to do something to protect them, like the ones you saw mounted on the boards, I spray, spray them with airbrush medium using an atomizer. Um, if you happen to have an atomizer, you can do that. If you don't, and you're not doing this in a big way, what's an easier solution is to just buy like Krylon or some other clear acrylic spray that you can get at a hobby store or, or the paint department of your home improvement store. Any kind of clear acrylic spray works great. And you can paint over that with acrylics if you decide you wanna add something to it later. So that's my preference is a clear acrylic spray. And there's also just put it in an envelope. There are plastic sleeves that you can mail postcards in, but you have to be extremely careful. There's only one type that goes through the, the mail sorting machines. And if you don't have the right type, they make you put extra postage on it anyway. So as far as I'm concerned, it's kind of like, that's not worth fooling with. Why not just put in a regular envelope and, and mail it that way? So that's the answer to that question. And that's kind of all I'm going to say about supplies for now. But I'll be happy to answer questions, you know, later um, at the end, or like I said, I've got it all, I think I've listed everything that I'm using in the uh, handout. So hopefully that will uh, alleviate your concerns about, oh, I gotta know what you're using. So I wanna get on to what happens when you get to the field with all this stuff and you're getting ready to paint. So bear with me just a moment while I get down to the right part of my notes. So when you go um, painting in the field, here's a very common situation. You look, so this, uh, this lighthouse, you come down the cliff on a set of stairs and you turn around the landing and you've, you're facing this scene. So I'm gonna guess there are like 5 million photographs that look exactly like this because every tourist that goes there goes down, you're walking down the steps, looking away from the lighthouse, you turn the corner and you're on the landing and it's like, ooh, look at that, I'm gonna take a picture of that. So when we get on a, a location like this, when we go out to paint, we see a scene like this and we think, ooh, that's great. And this is what I call the, the, the tourist, the iconic tourist photo. So, you know, because everybody has sort of led to this scene. That's probably why they put that landing there is because it's a great, you know, place viewpoint for people to look from. So we all take the same thing. And then the very next thing we think is, well, this is a nice spot. You know, it's kind of protected. I've got, a, got uh, maybe I'll just paint here. And in fact, when I went there, there were six people standing on that landing painting little paintings with their easels and everything. And they were all painting this scene. And the next thing that runs into your head is, how am I gonna paint this? So you immediately go, okay, there's my scene. Now I gotta think about like, what do I know about, how am I gonna put that texture in the rocks? And how am I gonna do the reflections in the water? And how am I gonna reserve the white around that, um, that lighthouse? So if you're pretty experienced, you might have answers to all of that stuff and off you go. But if you're getting started or if you're on a postcard and all your usual studio techniques don't work that small, you may be stuck. And then you think, well, let's see, I'm not sure how to handle this. I'm not sure how to handle that. And it's not going very well. So I'll just take a picture and um, raise your hand. I can't see you, but you know, raise your hand in your mind if you've been the person who goes out to paint in the field and comes back with one pretty crappy painting that you did right at the end and 500 pictures. <laughs> I know I've been there. Um, so, so you see these scenes like this and, and the first thing you think is, ah, oh, okay, like how am I gonna handle that gravel at the bottom? And what am I gonna do about those weeds in the corner? And how am I gonna reserve the white for the, for the surf? Oh, how am I gonna suggest fog? That, you know, gee, I'm not sure how, how to do that. And especially if you're new to painting, this just seems like too much. So you take a picture, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to draw boats. How am I gonna do that? How do I make that water look transparent? How do I show the rocks under the water? And uh, where do you even start? You know, so <laughs> so this is, this is kind of what happens to, and I, I'm like, I know I'm not the only one because I watch my students do it. I watch other people in workshops do it. So I'm gonna come back to some of these, but I wanna start by showing you. So the first demonstration I'm gonna do is, okay, how can we do a postcard where we flip that on its head 
And instead of asking ourselves, how do I paint this? Or how do I pick a subject to paint out of this? We're gonna ask the question of, with the materials I have with me and the skills I have today and the energy and time I have today, what can I do to get a little snippet of this experience, this scene, this day, how I'm feeling, whatever it might be, onto a postcard? So instead of saying, how do I paint this postcard of this scene? We're gonna say, what can I do with what I have available to me? Which is the opposite way of what we usually do it. You know, we usually do it the other way around. So ironically, uh, one of the easiest things you can do is to paint sunrise and sunset scenes, but not this kind of sunset. So everybody wants to paint sunrises and sunsets and this kind of thing has numerous challenges. Um, there's multiple layers of clouds. There's that bright white that you got to reserve somehow. There's um, orange right next to, or orangey tones next to bluish tones. You know, this is a challenging and it's complex. This is a lot, you, you would not be able to get most of this to happen on a postcard. If you're gonna do this scene, you probably wanna work full sheet. So instead of trying to paint again, say, how do I paint this scene? We're gonna ask the question of with what I have available to me today, how can I capture something about this little, a little snippet of this scene? Um, here's another one that, you know, like, ooh, that's cool, but we've got salmon pink clouds against a blue sky. Those are almost direct compliments. So that's gonna be really challenging to paint. So instead, what you wanna do with sunset scenes is either kind of really squint your eyes and just go for the colors, the various colors you see in the sky, or look for a scene like this, where here I've got pink against kind of a pinky gray, so there's no problem with compliments. I can lay in those colors next to each other, no, no issue. Something like this, where it's just bands of color, or just you know, get your paints out and make your own imaginary sunset, whatever it might be. A lot of times, if you look close to the horizon, you can just say, I'm not gonna, you know, I'll, I'll take a picture and worry about if I'm gonna try to do that in the studio, but for my postcard, I'm gonna do that for my sky. Does that capture everything? No. Does any painting capture everything? No, <laughs> so it's a postcard. We're not gonna try to put too much weight on our postcard. We're gonna try to do what's doable on a postcard. So we're gonna take that approach to our, our sunset. And excuse me while I get back to my table here. So then the next thing we're gonna do is add a silhouette. So one of the simplest things you can do is create your imaginary sunset. And this one actually has a couple extra complications because I put the sun in and sparkles on the water, but we're gonna start with one where we don't even have that. We just have a sunset sky and a silhouette. That can be a great postcard. It does not have to be super, super complicated. So, you know, this is just a sunset sky and um, then I painted a silhouette and I actually made some like little brush marks in there to suggest windows and stuff. But, but literally this took, um, after the wash was dry, you know, the total work time here is like five minutes. So um, you, you do have to let that first wash dry before you can paint on top of it, but there's even a solution for that. Paint your sunset ahead of time. <laughs> And hang on a second, I'm gonna, um, I, because I have, it's, speaking of sunsets, there's direct west sun coming in the window right now. So these colors are really washed out. So let me just make a little adjustment to the camera so that we can see the color a little better. If I can find the window, I got so many windows open, I can't find the adjustment window. Where are you? There we go. All right, so I'm gonna turn the brightness down just a tad. There we go. All right. So I can paint this ahead of time. I can paint a whole bunch of them. 
so you can do little sky studies from home. You know, uh, it's your boring neighborhood underneath the sky, but you can capture various sunrises and sunsets and then take them with that with you. So trick number one, this is, uh, you know, one of my strategies is do lots of sky studies and then take them with you. And when you're in the field and you want to do a postcard, pull out one that suits your subject or your mood or whatever. It doesn't have to match the sky that you see that day. It can be anything and you can, you know, make a fun postcard. So I have wash number one already dry and maybe even wash number two. So the next thing I'm gonna do is take my, the scene that I want to paint. And so what I did was I went online and I found um, a photo of the uh, Capitol building downtown uh, in St. Paul, and I just traced it. So you can use your computer screen as a light box. Anything you have a photo of or can find a photo of, you can just get the photo the size you wanted on your screen, put your piece of paper up and trace the silhouette. If you have a phone or a tablet, there's, I know if you try to trace, it moves around, right? But there's something called guided access on um, both I, I, iOS devices and Android. And this is on the handout, so you don't need to write this down. Um, where you can freeze a portion of the screen so you can trace without it moving around. So even if you're traveling, you can snap a picture on your phone, get the silhouette off your phone and transfer it to your postcard. So what I'm gonna do since I'm traveling and I don't wanna carry things like graphite paper and so forth with me is I've traced my silhouette. I'm gonna flip it over and on the back side, I'm gonna scribble with a pencil and make, you know, like poor person's cheapo graphite transfer paper. So this is just ordinary copy paper that I'm working on right here. And I only need to scribble on the part that has the silhouette. And then I will put it on my postcard where I want it. I kind of use the tape to feel. And since this is a sunset scene, I want most of the focus to be on the sunset. So I'm kind of putting my silhouette in this one down towards the bottom. And then I'm going to take, um, I like to use a gel pen that's got color to it so I can see where I've traced. And I'm just gonna trace over the silhouette. And this is gonna transfer down on the bottom. Oops, looks like I didn't scribble on enough of it. You scribble a little farther up. So it doesn't usually show up great on the um, video, but I'm just gonna quickly transfer it. And I think you get the idea. If you're good at drawing, if this is no big deal to you, then you just draw the silhouette. You don't have to transfer it. But this is for those of you who are just starting out and you're feeling like, well, gee, I can't even draw yet. So you can still do a painting that is satisfying. Now, I know that doesn't show up very well on the, um, on the camera. So I'll darken up a little bit of it so maybe you can see it a bit. But I think you get the idea of what I'm doing. And so now what I'm going to do is um, get myself some water. And when I mix my color to fill in my silhouette, the trick that makes this work pretty well is use the, the colors that you used up here, involve them in what you're using to mix your silhouette and then add a little bit of a complementary color to kind of darken it and gray it down. So I've got both a yellow and a pink up here to make these orangey tones. So I'm going to use those same two pigments and mix up kind of an orange. And then the complement of orange is blue. So I'm gonna add some blue to it. And I won't take it all the way to a gray. I'll leave it at kind of a dull violet or a dull, you know, sort of orangey brown. And then all I'm going to do is fill in my silhouette.
and it's just a postcard. So I'm not worrying about being like super accurate or super careful or whatever. Because remember, when you're painting a postcard, you're going to flip it over and write on the other side. So you don't have to tell the whole story with the image. You can tell some of the story with words. And then there's a sort of a tree over here. So like I'm doing this really fast, but you know, sometimes when you're in the field, that's all the time you have. And then there's another little tree over here. Is that painting gonna win awards anywhere? Probably not. Is that gonna be fine to mail to somebody and say, hey, wish you were here. We're here, you know, in St. Paul at the Capitol Dome and uh, the sunset was really pretty tonight. And you'll make somebody smile. If you wanna do a little bit more, you can come back in like I did on this one and add, you know, trace some more stuff, add some suggestion of windows and so forth, but still kind of leave it vague or you can keep, you know, adding things down here but you don't have to keep adding things for it to be enough of a story to make a decent postcard. So that allows you to have success without having to you know, stress about it. And literally, I mean, especially if you didn't have to trace, if you were able to draw that silhouette or find something that you can draw a silhouette of uh, quickly, this is, you know, takes five minutes to do a postcard like this. If you want to add details, you can add details later too. You can, you know, after you get home or back to your hotel or whatever, if you're traveling. It's not a very big step from this to something like this. So let's talk about what additional work had to be done to do this scene. In this scene, what I did was I put a coin down. There's my coin. Uh, I put a coin down in the place where I wanted the sun and I take a spray bottle and I mist all around that area. So then I pick the coin up. So this masks a little circle without using masking fluid, takes no time at all. And then I paint my wash around it and that mist carries the color in around the sun. This is in several of my postcard paint alongs, so I'm not gonna demonstrate how to do that, but it's another very quick little trick that you can do that any beginner can do. So the only difference between this sky and this sky was I masked the sun on this sky, or it could be a moon if you change the colors. And then I added these little sparkles in the water, and I'm not gonna demonstrate how to do that, but that's like one more step. So. You can first, if you're a beginner, you can learn to do this. Then you can add a step to have the sun and maybe still have like a building or something that doesn't have reflections. Then you can learn how to do one more step that adds sparkles in the water. And in every case, you just add a silhouette. The silhouette's important because it gives you the contrast that you need to make it an interesting painting. But I don't need any detail inside this silhouette. I just traced a heron. And down here, I was showing people how to use their brush to make a little bit of grass. So in this painting, someone who's painted maybe a couple of paintings before like this, can they may have the skills to add some more complications. If you don't have those skills yet, you can stick with this. If you have a lot more skills, you can start with this get this much down on location, add detail later. So in every case, what we've done here is we've said, how can I make a painting that captures something about the scene with the tools I have available and the skills I have avail available? Instead of going, how do I paint all those windows? How do I come, you know, and complicating things, <laughs> we just do work with what we've got. So let's, let's go back to our lighthouse now. Stand by, we're getting to that point where there's always too many wet things floating around. So. All right, so I'm gonna 
take us back to that photo and stick it up in the corner. All right, so now the only thing that's kind of maybe a challenge to draw here would be the lighthouse. So I traced my little lighthouse and I'm gonna use the same sort of idea, but I don't feel like this cliff has to be so perfect that I've got to trace that. So I'm just gonna eyeball that. I'm just gonna say, you know what, even if I'm a beginner, even if I'm using my non-dominant hand, I can do something that, that's gonna look like cliffs, you know, uh, and sort of looks like this one, and it doesn't have to be perfect. And then I can decide that my water's gonna be like down here somewhere and there's some more rocks down here. And I don't have to show all of those rocks in the foreground. If I don't know a good technique to do that quickly, let's just let's just make a, a darker area there. So I'm just kind of drawing um, some random shapes that are going to be where I'm going to put some rocks. And now I'm going to put my lighthouse in the same way I did before. I'm going to scribble on the back. Oops, let me get it over a little bit farther. Going to transfer that where I want it. And I think I got my landmass too low down, but that's okay. I'll put my lighthouse where I want and I'll make the land fit to it the other way. And okay. So, oops. All right. So, let me darken that up so that hopefully you can see a little bit of it. So I got my lighthouse where I want it. So I'm going to make this land come up to it. Now, is that a very accurate rendering of what's in the scene? No, but it's close enough that somebody who's been there is going to kind of recognize that as that sort of cliff that that lighthouse sits on. So again, it's a postcard. I'm not going to stress myself out about perfect accuracy. I'm going to do what I can with the time and resources I have available. So now I'm going to do the very same kind of mixture of color that I did before, because this is basically the same two colors. So I make my kind of orange tone, add some blue to it to get sort of a, a grayed orange or a purpley brown or something in that general range. And now what I'm going to do for this one is for the lighthouse, since it's a white object, I'm going to go with a slightly paler amount of color up there. But still, I'm just kind of doing the silhouette. And then everything on the cliff, I'm going to just fill it all in. It's a postcard, don't need any details. Fill it all in down to the water and at the water line I'm going to just stop because I'll imagine that the sky is re reflecting into that water. And over on this end where we might be facing the sunset maybe I'll make it a little paler but I don't absolutely have to. Then in the foreground, I'm not going to try to paint all those rocks. I'm just going to paint some things that could be rocky areas. Just random brush marks, basically. And, you know, as the tide goes in and out, this all changes anyway. So, you know, nobody that's, that's not there is going to know what those rocks actually looked like at that moment anyhow. So I don't have to worry about it. So again, you know, like five minutes worth of work and I have something that would be a reasonable postcard. If I have time and I want to play with this some more, I could say, you know, one way to suggest rocks might be to just drop some color in and see if I, or drop some water in and see if I can get some intentional blooms here in the foreground. So let me play with that. 
And what if I wanted a little bit of darker shadowing in a few places on the back side of this cliff? You know, maybe I could just randomly, no one knows where those shadows are going to be um, at sunset. Maybe I could just add a little bit of shadowing. Maybe I could add a little shadow on the back side of my lighthouse. Now, the, the one thing that's a little weird looking about this is that the water down here usually wouldn't be the same value as the sky. So if I have more, more time, I actually do this at the end because what I'm going to use is my dirty rinse water. And I'm going to just glaze over this area with my, my do what I call a dirty water wash just a little bit of color from my rinse water to knock that down and make it a little bit darker value. And now, hey, you know what? I, I like that pretty well as a postcard. And I write on the back, hey, you know, uh, here we are at sunset. Now, was I there at sunset? No. Do I know exactly how the shadows fall? No. Is it still kind of believable? Sure. You know, so um, again, if, if I'm interested in, you know, if I'm making a guidebook to here's how to find, you know, like the old mariners used to do where they're telling people how to find a harbor, then maybe I need to get that cliff just right. If I'm sending a postcard to a friend and I want to say, hey, we were down at the tide pools and it was such a cool day and we had such, so much fun. And again, I can go back to the hotel and say, you know what, I want to add a little bit more darker values here in the foreground um, kind of add a little texture. I can add stuff later, but at any stage really, after I put in that first wash, I had something that's a perfectly acceptable postcard. Okay, let's take it another step. So the next step would be to say, well, you know what? Um, if I'm willing to do a little bit more work, it doesn't have to be, you know, just a silhouette. It could be a silhouette and then some other things that I happen to maybe know how to do. So um, bear with me now while I find <laughs> the next stack. Had everything nicely stacked so that I could do all this uh, step by step. And I've managed to already mess up my stacks. So this is an example of, another almost silhouette. So to do the sky here, instead of doing a sunset sky, I was playing around with just kind of spattering and spraying color and seeing if it would suggest some clouds. And I had that sky floating around. Here I was playing with dry brushing. So this is just a postcard so I could experiment with, can I sort of dry brush here and suggest waves, is that good enough? And then this is just a silhouette. So again, this could be a postcard that I could mail to somebody and say, hey, you know, this is a little haystack rock over here in Pacific City. I was out here today. And again, a beginner can do this. If you don't know whether you can do this, you can certainly give it a shot. And if it doesn't work, it's just a postcard. And you probably spent, you know, five minutes on it. So it's not so stressful. It gives you a chance to give it a, a shot. So let's try that with our, um, with our lighthouse. So we already have our lighthouse traced. I'm going to do the same kind of thing with my cliff. I'm just going to kind of quickly suggest that shape. And I'll put my lighthouse in. I'm going to put it in a little bigger this time. So the next challenge for somebody who's kind of new to this, well, that one's really big, is, uh, I think I'm going to use a little one, that looks way too out of scale for a postcard, is um, how do I reserve that white on the postcard? So I'm in the field, I don't have masking fluid with me, um, I, you know, I actually do carry it, but in one of those little mask pens, but I don't use it very much in the field. So let's pretend I don't have any masking fluid. I got this white lighthouse and I don't want to do sunset. I want to do something more like, you know, the conditions that I actually have in this photo. So let me suggest a few of these foreground shapes. 
So same kind of just sort of random stuff here. And now I have to figure out how am I going to put that wash in and reserve that white. Now, if you've been painting for a little while, you're like, that's not hard. I can paint around that. But if you're brand new, you might be thinking, oh, I don't know if I can pull that off um, and have an even wash around the rest of it. So one thing you can do is say, well, what do I know how to do? Well, I know how to put paint on paper. So what if I allowed myself to have some clouds in background there so that I could break up that wash in the sky and I don't have to make an even wash over the whole page. So instead of going, how do I paint that blue sky that's, you know, uninterrupted blue, I'm gonna pretend that it's a day where there are a few clouds and I'm gonna use those clouds to help me out. So, stand by, to get some fresh water. So let's just start with a little bit of blue. I mix up whatever I know about blue. I'm not worrying about getting perfect matches right now. I'm giving myself some blue to make a sky with. So one of the tricks I, I teach my students is if you're trying to do clouds in the sky on a postcard, instead of holding your brush like this, hold your brush like this and scumble or scrub it back and forth. So I'm going to start over here by the, um, the lighthouse because I do want to reserve that white. And I'm going to put my brush right next to it and pull away from it. And then I'm going to scribble like this to make the suggestion of clouds. So I put my brush right next to it and scribble away from it. I don't have to lay a uniform wash because there's clouds in the sky. Now that looks super messy right now. So one thing I tell people is don't judge anything about your postcard until you pull the tape, because especially on a postcard, you'll be heavily influenced by this mess around the edge. So let's don't worry about the fact that it looks a little messy right now. Let's just keep on going. So the next thing I, I know how to do is I know how to make a big uh, gray shape. I can make a gray shape for those rocks. I have no idea how to make the texture of those rocks. So I'm not going to. Do I need to do that in a postcard? No, probably not. And if I do, I'll find out. So I'm going to mix a gray. I'm using um, cobalt blue and burnt sienna because I use cobalt blue in the sky. So that'll give me a, a quick sort of a gray. And yes, these rocks have all signs, kinds of colors in them, but nobody else is here looking at it right now. So I'm just going to paint them all this same color. And then over here where they're greener, I'll come back and drop some color in. But right now, I'm just going to get that whole land mass in there. Because it's a postcard. And I don't need any more than that to sort of tell the story. I'm going to go around the water for right now. So everything that's rocks, I'm putting my same gray over all of it. And now while it's still wet, since that dropping things in wet and wet stuff worked pretty well before, let's do some more of that. Let's drop in some darker color down along the bottom and over here where that shadow is and over here. And then let's make some green. And we'll put in a little green up here for where the grass is at the top.
And maybe I'll even drop in some of these sort of yellow tones here. I don't know, not wild about that, but that's okay. And then again, down here where I have the water, what I wanna do is just kind of echo what happened in the sky. So I'm going to get my blue again and just kind of scribble. And it's still wet, so I don't think I can do the dirty water wash thing down there yet. So we'll have to wait. Now the, uh, the lighthouse doesn't really stand out very well yet. So it's like, oh, where is the lighthouse? We can't see it. So what I'm going to do is give my lighthouse a little definition. So line and wash is popular in the field because of this exact thing. When you have small details on a postcard, it's really hard to get in there with a brush and suggest them all. So I actually have a dip pen. Uh, you could use a watercolor pencil for this kind of thing too. That would work really well. But you can mix any color you like with watercolor. Let's see, I'm gonna go with a, like a darker gray. So I'm using ultramarine blue and burnt sienna now just to get it a little darker. And you don't have to mix enough to dip your dip pen in. Even though it's called a dip pen, you don't have to dip it. You can load it like this. You just put the brush, um, use the brush to load the dip pen. And then sometimes that makes a blob, so I always scribble on the tape. And then I can come up here and say, well, I've got these black parts on the, um, the lighthouse. I'll just do those with a dip pen because that's a heck of a lot easier. So that helps. And then I need to do the shadow side here, but I'm gonna have to wait for that to dry. So hang on just a second. I think I can take a little color away. All right, so that's not, <laughs> just threw my brush across the room, grab another one. That's a good thing when you do that. It tells you you're relaxed. You're not holding brush and white knuckle so what I'm going to do now is um, preferably wait for all that black stuff to dry, but I'm going to fill my, um, my lighthouse with clear water. And then I'm going to take a little of my gray and put it on the shadow side. At least I think I'm, no, didn't get it, didn't get it wet. Fill my lighthouse with clear water. And then I will take my gray and put it on the shadow side. That's a little darker than I like, so let's lift a little bit of that out with the brush. And now I have my lighthouse. And that's all I really need to tell the story of the fact that there's a lighthouse up there. Now, this is pretty pale, and it would probably be nice to add another layer on it, but I don't have to do it right now. And this is wet. So um, if you're, you know, you guys all live in Minnesota or Wisconsin, you know what it's like and you go out painting and it's so humid that you put your first wash down and it doesn't dry. So what I often do is at this point, I will do an ink drawing. And then I have my, I have my ink drawing. I take that home and I use that to help me decide if I want to add any more to this or you know if you're into taking photos you can take a photo and then I can add detail later but honestly um, all I really need is a few darker values like I did with my um, my uh, sunset version and and I'd be good to go you know this probably needs one more layer and we we probably could even add it now um, without it getting too mushy since it's getting starting to dry. So I could add some of the shadows that are over here. I could add some of the shadows. Oh, and, and never underestimate the, um, the power of fingers. I finger paint all the time. On a postcard, it works really well to kind of give you a soft edge and smudge things where you need to. 
And, and as you can see, uh, once again, the, um, sorry, uh, ran into that can't talk and paint at the same time thing there for a minute. Um, the water should be darker. So I might want to go over that as well. So I'm not trying to reproduce exactly what's there. I'm just trying to give it enough little extra definition and maybe a little texturing here. Scribble my brush. So, you know, you can keep fussing and fiddling with it, but you could also say, there we go, there's a postcard. I can turn it over and write on the back. Remember, you've got words to work with as well as images. And this is something that a complete beginner can do. They can finish it successfully in, you know, 10 or 15 minutes and feel like you, you accomplished something instead of feeling like you have to like paint every little photo realistic detail. I think we can probably get our, our water, our darker water in there now too, if we want to. What if it doesn't turn out? It's just a postcard. I'll just do another one. Take what I learned in that 10 or 15 minutes, do another one, do another one, do another one until I get one that I'm happy with. But I'm actually happy with it. You know, it's not, it's not bad. It's not fabulous. It's not going to win some award, but it also is what I could accomplish with the time and materials available to me. All right, let's see what's next. I have to look at my notes to see what's next and time. So we've got about another 15 minutes. I'm gonna think about what I wanna show you next. I wanna show you some things that, um, I'm not gonna demonstrate the whole thing because I don't think you need to see the demonstration to get the idea. So one is, uh, I, I'm not talking at all right now or not demonstrating line and wash because again, that's something I have some videos on. But if you are doing line and wash, um, let me let me show you why people like line and wash. So this is the uh, conservatory dome in St. Paul. Um, and it's kind of, there's a lot going on. Oops, I'm sorry, you can't see that. <laughs> let me switch my camera. There we go. Um, there's a lot going on in that scene and it's a pretty challenging thing with a lot of glass, you know, hard to, hard to capture. And so it just kind of looks mushy when you do it in just plain watercolor if you're doing it super fast. So what I like to do with situations like that is I like to do an ink drawing of just part of it. And I actually like when I, when I draw with kind of a wobbly ink line. So that's why I draw with ink rather than pencil. I'm not trying to be an architectural rendering. I'm trying to let my pen capture where my eye went. Because drawings like this are for me. They're for me to help me focus my attention. But the nice thing about this is I can draw just this partial bit of it. If I wanted to turn something like this into a postcard, simply adding a few washes really helps to bring out more of the feel of that. I can kind of now sort of see the, the glossiness of the glass and you can see the palms sort of shining through inside the palm dome. And then if I want to keep complicating it, I can. Honestly, I think I should have stopped here. I think this is more, to me, this is a more interesting postcard than, than this just looks, starts to look overworked. But one other strategy is don't try to do the whole thing. Doing an in, uh, incomplete portion of just the interesting part is basically what you do in writing on the other side of the postcard. So think to yourself, what could I write on a postcard? You're not going to write on the postcard, you know, the Palm Dome has 4,763 panes of glass and they're arranged in a radial pattern, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's not what you're going to write. You're going to write, oh, it was really cool. There was light reflecting off of it and you could kind of see inside to see the palms. That's what this says. So you can say in the image part of a postcard about the same amount as you could say in the words part of the postcard. And that helps you go, okay, what is manageable in the amount of time that I have 
with the materials that I have and so forth. So that you um, create something that now, you know, I think this would actually be a charming postcard for somebody to receive with the, the text on the back explaining, you know, this is why I, I drew this sketch. I had like 10 minutes and I just captured kind of the outline of it and that suggestion of the, the glass kind of re being reflective and I can see a little bit of the palms inside it. So, um, so another yeah. strip question. Lynn, have, yeah, Lynn, this is Art. I have a question. What kind, of, what kind of paper and what weight paper would you recommend for sending postcards in the mail? Uh, okay, so I did address this on the handout, but paper I use, I cut up uh, my usual studio paper. Okay. I also, in, in my case, I cut up any paper that I have that I need to use up in my studio. But what I recommend people do is just take whatever paper you use in the studio, cut it into four by six rectangles. You can get 20 of them out of a full sheet. And if one doesn't turn out, you can flip it over, paint it on the back. And if the one on the back turns out, turn it into a greeting card. So um, you can also buy pre-printed postcards uh, most of those are wood pulp papers and, um, you know, they have a different behavior. Some people like it. I'm not fond of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's my preference. Um, I do have one uh, postcard. There's a one, uh, a 100% a cotton postcard by Etcher Labs that um, I did put that on the handout. That's my favorite one. It's about a 110 or 120 pound paper, but I usually just, these are just, you know, regular watercolor paper cut up yep. and made into um, four by six rectangles, you know, just take a day and, you know, get out a straight edge and cut a bunch of them. One, one thing yeah. I do know, one thing I do know is don't make your postcards square because you'll pay a real premium at the post office. Oh, post yes. Office. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, do, wherever you happen to be mailing your postcards from, do check what the postal regulations are in your area. <laughs> so in the US, four by six is fine. It needs a long, and, and I think you can go down to as far as three and a half by five and a half and up to uh, four and a half by six and a half before you need more postage. If you make it square, it's not machine sortable. Right. So it's just like putting it in plastic. But yeah, but you can, you know, I mean, you can do it. It can be anything and you can, you can make them. I mean, I have sometimes when I do like five by seven, just because it, you know, feels like an, I like that shape of rectangle better. And then I put them in a five by seven envelope that would take like a greeting card, you know, so you can make them whatever size you want. But yeah, you're right. Um, don't make them square unless you want to put extra postage on them. <laughs> But what you can do is if you want to do a square painting is do it on a four by six postcard and tape it off to a square, you know, and just have it set in the center of a larger painting. So uh, one of the things that I was going to show you, and we'll just skip to it, is sometimes instead of being so super realistic, this is also a silhouette painting. And what I did was I just put some pieces of tape and um, there was, I think there was a window or something I was kind of using for shapes here, but otherwise it's just kind of a random design. And all I did was wet this whole area and drop in color. So I traced the silhouette of this flower in this kind of odd shaped vase and the edge of the table. And then I wet everything except a few white areas and just dropped in color. So again, a beginner can do this. If you need to, if you don't feel like you draw well enough, you take your picture with your phone and you trace it. And then this was just kind of random colors that were around. And that would be an interesting postcard. I'd be perfectly happy with that. You can also just go, I'm purely gonna do abstract expressionism based on the colors that are around here. I mean, the postcard doesn't have to be, it's between you and the person you're sending it to. So if you know the other person is into blue and orange, you can say, you know, these colors were just everywhere. Everything is terracotta and blue sky. And so I just kind of made this little stained glass postcard for you of all the colors I'm seeing around me. I'd be happy to get that. I think a lot of people would. You don't have to stick to realistic color. So um, I was doing these, like playing with different ways to do waves on the beach and, you know, exploring putting in little silhouettes of people and stuff. And by the way, this person, I did the very same thing, just if you don't feel confident drawing people, 
just get a silhouette and transfer the silhouette and then use your brush to fill it in with color. Um, so I'm just playing around, but of course, are these natural colors? Heck no, you know, I never saw a beach with bright yellow waves, but if I know somebody who really loves this color scheme, then, you know, this could be a great postcard to send to them. And I can write, especially if you're sending a postcard to another artist friend, you know, you can write on the back, I'm playing around experimenting with different ways to suggest breaking waves. You know, I'm not sure how successful this is, but eh, there's some things I like about it. And I pop it in the mail. And believe me, I don't care what you send. Almost none of us gets like real physical mail from somebody else. And the fact that somebody painted you a postcard and send it to you, it doesn't matter how crappy the postcard is, they will be delighted. Another little thing that you can do is add aphids. So, um, what I mean by aphids, you know, those little bugs that grow on, that go on like roses and stuff and how tiny they are. So a lot of the paintings that I paint in the field are actually smaller than postcards. This is one of my tiny escapes. And these are um, two and a half by three and a half. So um, quite a bit smaller. And so when I put people in them, they are literally like the size of an aphid. And let me see if I can get that to focus closer. So it's a couple people walking the dog, right? Mm -hmm. At least that's what people interpret it as. And, and actually it's just, I took my little dip pen and I made some scribbles and I practiced on another piece of paper until I had some scribbles that I thought looked like, you know, um, people and I scribbled them on there. If you feel like, oh, I could never pull that off. Here's another trick. So there's a little kayaker in this scene get in close again. Focus. That's a little kayaker, right? Yeah, so all I did was take the silhouette of a kayaker from somewhere else. And in this case, I put it on the paper first with masking fluid um, using one of those little masking fluid pens like this, this little PBO masking fluid pen. Um, but and another thing you can do is use the dip pen and, and put, again, the little silhouette of the kayaker and the kayak with masking fluid. Then I painted the whole painting, took the masking fluid off, and then filled in the color for my figure. The reason I do it that way sometimes is if I'm not sure if I can draw that so that I like it, masking fluid is great because if you don't like it, let the masking fluid dry, lift it off, and try again. So you can kind of erase masking fluid, basically. You know, if you don't paint anything on there, you just put it on there and take it right back off, you, you know, you're just back to the paper and you can try again. So if I'm gonna put little people in, if I either want rim lighting on them, or if I'm not sure if I can get that silhouette right, sometimes what I do is I put them in with masking fluid and then fill in the color later so that I've got that silhouette and I can look at it in the masking fluid and go, mm, I don't like that. I'm gonna take that one off and try again. Sometimes on some papers, lifting masking fluid will leave a little bit of a mark, but that's okay because if I haven't painted at all and I try to put them in and I'm like, yeah, that doesn't look very good, try it on the back side, <laughs> you know, because I haven't, it won't affect, I can still write on my front side on the postcard. So um, my, my watch is telling me that it's time for me to stop yakking constantly. And <laughs> I, I have like 15 more ideas for, that I could share with you, but there's just no way I can do it all in an hour and a half or two hours. So I think it's time for me to let you ask some questions <laughs> and see who's confused about what. <laughs> and we'll go from there. Okay. So, so what, are your, what are your questions? <laughs> Art, do you have any questions lined up? Yes, I have, I have a question. Um, it seems like you've spent a lot of time simplifying shapes and studying shapes to do these little vignettes uh, with simplified colors. Is that mm -hmm. part of your repertoire to, to well, study? Well, for, for postcards, yeah. Okay. And, and that's why I keep telling people, look for the silhouette. Because I know learning to simplify is really hard. When your, your brain, want, we, our brains are designed to 
divide things up into things instead of grouping them together into shapes. But if you're telling yourself, I'm just trying to trace the outer silhouette, that helps a lot. Because this is like the ultimate simplification. It's only gonna be two things. It's gonna be the sky and the top of the cliff, or it's gonna be, you know, and that way you don't, it's gonna be the building, but no details inside the building. And that way you kind of interrupt that because it's hard for people to know what to simplify in a scene like this. Like if, if you just had the, the view of the Capitol Dome, knowing what to simplify, what to include, what not to include is really hard for most people, um, especially beginners. But they can trace the upper silhouette. That they can do. And this is like the ultimate simplification. And then, let's see. And then you can complicate it if you want to. And I think that's much easier than saying, uh, most people approach it the other direction. What am I going to edit out? What am I going to group together? What am I going to, you know, instead of saying, I'm just going to make a giant division between silhouette and sky. And then maybe I can add details. So with all of my stuff with postcards, as I was, I mean, I, I didn't start out doing this, but this is what I kind of was led to by trying to design things that beginners could tackle. Instead of trying to say, well, you got to see the big shapes and join things into masses and all that stuff that I know as a beginner, I was not capable of doing. Because <laughs> I, you know, I kept like, but, but it's a tree and a building. I've got to do the tree separate from the building. You know, that's, that's what I wanted to do. That's what my brain told me to do. But if somebody would have just said, okay, hey, just uh, trace the upper silhouette, do that much. Okay, so there's a postcard that I could take somebody who's never painted in watercolor, never painted at all, and in a, you know, a half an hour at the most, they could do this, you know, and then we can go from there. We can complicate it from there. Does that make sense? Yes. Lynn, I'd like to pass along some of the comments people made. Okay. <clears throat> um, the first one here is, your technique on postcard painting seems more focused, one simple painting than the technique currently being done by urban sketchers who attempt to catch, capture memories. Nice. Um, <clears throat> another one, you're very nice for explaining things. <laughs> uh, I actually love that you don't describe everything in detail, just suggest loosely. Thank you for the tip on loading a dip pen with watercolor. Um, if these postcards are being sent to other, oh, that was about the spray and Art and I answered that one. Um, the yellow beaches remind me of sepia colors of old photos. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It does. I love that this brings the joy of art into our everyday lives. It's not overly precious, not just for hanging on the wall. What a great approach to lift our creative spirit. And then Lynn, do you want to ask your question or should I just read it? I'll go ahead and read it. Will you talk a bit about how your experience with painting just postcards has influenced how you approach your art in the wider sense? Sure. Um, well, I, I should say I, I haven't been painting just postcards. So um, I wanna say something about that urban sketchers comment. I, I do that too. So this is, you know, like what my sketchbooks look like. I do a lot of line drawings. I do tape in postcards sometimes that I want to hang on to. I write notes. Uh, I, I journal, you know, so this, what goes in my sketchbooks is a little bit more like what you might think about urban sketchers doing, although I'm not doing very urban scenes here. Um, but, but that does happen. You know, I do that too. But the postcard paint alongs were made for very specific purpose. And that was people who were stressed by COVID and looking for something to keep them going with their art. And in conversations with many, many beginners who were learning from those, um, I, I kind of took away those like big takeaways that I was talking about at the beginning. And really that's kind of what I took into my own uh, art 
is it's not so much that I changed what I was doing stylistically all that much, but I flipped my approach um, because I used to just, I used to do the same thing. I would look at a scene and think to myself, well, I know how to paint that and I know how to paint that and I know how to paint that. And I can, here, here's how I can make a painting out of that. And, you know, here's how I'm going to design it. Sort of the classical way of, of approaching it. And um, I would do some, you know, thumbnails and, and try to like choose a subject a little bit mindfully, but this is really much more, um, taking the opposite a, a direction. Instead of going, how do I take all this complexity and simplify it down um, and, and use good design and all that sort of stuff? I kind of just said, look, a beginner can't do any of that stuff. So let's say, what can I do with the skills that I have? And in this case, it wasn't even like, what can I do with the skills that I have? Because it wouldn't help a beginner for me to sit down and like watch, have them watch me paint this because mm -hmm. especially the, these really tiny ones, it took me a long time to figure out how I was going to handle and make it work on a scale this small, um, you know, and what to simplify and what not, what techniques to use. It would not help for me to say, what can I do? What, what helped beginners was for me to say, suppose I were a beginner, beginner what could I do with what only a beginner knows or could grasp quickly? And the interesting thing about that is you can do a lot, especially if it's just for a postcard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for a postcard, if I were to, if I were to take something like this and blow it up to a full size painting, it'd probably be kind of boring. You know, there's not really enough going on for this to be a full sheet unless I do some really cool textural effects or something in the watercolor. This is like, eh. but for a postcard, it's great. And if you're trying to, either practice skills or explore possibilities or get a beginner started with some success, then, you know, this is perfect. And then what I do is I tell myself, for me, this postcard would not be a miniature version of a painting I would do in the studio. It would be an excerpt from a painting I would do right. in the studio. So I might expand it. So I tell, I'm telling myself all the time, um, I say to myself, Crop, don't shrink. Extend, don't expand, don't blow up, you know. So if I were going to paint a bigger painting based on this postcard, what I would do would be to extend and include more of what was in the scene. Put in some people on the beach, have the waves breaking, you know, have more <laughs> of the sky and maybe still have the rock be that size. Or I'd completely redesign it so that it was more about something other than just that silhouette. But for postcard, that's perfect. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. And part of that's because uh, the work that I'm doing right now mostly is fairly abstract. So <laughs> this is more about what I do in my sketchbook and teaching. For me, postcards and the tiny escapes and so forth are the first step. And then I continue to abstract from there to get to where I am with my studio painting. So um, I think it's probably the, it's very blown out because the light, the sunlight's still falling on it. But, you know, the stuff behind me, this really abstract wave stuff is what I'm working on in my own painting right now. I, I'm not sure the postcard stuff has really affected it, except for those lessons about choose the right amount of challenge for today. You know, what are you up for today? It doesn't have to be every painting is more challenging than the last one. And sometimes sometimes doing a little simple, like these, these uh, little five by sevens, you know, sometimes doing something like that, something simple like that, where it's just like, you know, I can, I can do this. I don't have to think too hard about it. Sometimes that's what you need from your art and telling yourself, oh, you know, I'm beyond that. I'm past that. That's too simple for me is, is kind of silly, but, but we sort of, we don't really think of it that way consciously, I don't think, but we do it to ourselves all the time. You know, like I gotta, I gotta jazz it up somehow, make it a little bit, you know, that that's not good enough. And right. sometimes that is good enough. <laughs> um, Barb, Barb Carriger made a comment that feeds right in to what you just said. She said, what a refreshing approach to watercolor. 
we all get <clears throat> we all get so involved in learning new techniques and or perfecting them that we forget how rewarding it is to send a postcard or greeting card to a loved one. We should make this an everyday warm up exercise. Thank you. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. I, I don't know that I'm sending postcard every day, but I am definitely allowing myself, you know, because I'm doing all this, like, what is this? I look at this and say to myself, what does this have to do with the series that I'm working on? You know, all these abstract wave shapes and stuff. The answer is not really anything, but who cares? You right. know, I, I, I enjoyed doing this too. This is something that, you know, for me to go out and paint in the field, it's really an excuse to just be out in nature and connect to the world around me, the beauty in the world around me. Right. Without having to put a whole lot of stress on myself. And, you know, I'm finding that this kind of a painting for me is not terribly challenging. It's at the like the right level of challenging. But for a beginner, this might be too challenging. And for a beginner, simply doing one of those silhouette paintings might be a good place to start. So, right. you know. I have a couple of other questions. One is... Um, your limited color palette in most of the ones that you showed us is so effective and makes it really manageable, I think, on site. So what advice would you give us about how to choose colors or um, you said a little bit about that, you know, be careful about compliments, yeah. <laughs> but is there any other advice? So um, I actually have quite a bit of advice about color. And unfortunately, I made a whole video about how to choose colors for watercolor. And somehow the video got corrupted. So I have to re-record it, unfortunately, oh. or I would have given you a link to it. But here, here's the answer in a nutshell. What I tell my beginners is I advise them to buy five colors. Um, I suggest that they buy uh, a, a red, a yellow, and a blue that are, and this also is on the handout, by the way, so you don't have to like try to make notes about this. Okay. Um, that are pretty evenly spaced on the color wheel. So the ones that I've been, um, you know, the same color name in different manufacturers can be different. So I, I think I gave like three different common brands, like maybe this in this brand, maybe that in that brand. So basically the idea is I try to find a red, yellow, and blue that are pretty evenly spaced so that you get nice secondaries and that have about the same tinting strength. Um, more experienced people, it doesn't matter too much, but I've found that a lot of like beginner sets will have uh, phthalo blue involved and it's so powerful that it's hard for people to learn color mixing. Mm -hmm. So I have them usually buy cobalt blue instead because it's not quite so overpowering. And then, so they've got the red, yellow, and blue, and then um, they add a darker blue and a darker brown so that they can quickly get grays from warm to cool. So I usually say, ultramarine blue and burnt sienna or burnt umber. And those five colors will give you, in fact, stand by just a minute. Actually have the color wheels right here. So let me just sort of show you. So this is the red, yellow, and blue I have my students buy. And, you know, that's a pretty good range of colors um, that you can mix just from this is M. Graham's Azo Yellow Cobalt Blue and Quinn Rose. Um, and to compare, this is a color wheel made with a split primary, uh, which is what a lot of people recommend. And yeah, you can get some, you know, somewhat brighter secondaries with the split primary, but I'm not sure you're really buying yourself enough to carry all those extra colors and have the extra learning for beginners. And what I have noticed is that people who start with a split primary, eventually, um, like for me, I dropped one of the reds, added a bunch of blues, you know, move things around, they, they migrate away from it anyway. So I'm not sure that it's worth buying all those extra colors for the small amount of additional brilliance you can get here. Not much, you know, a little bit in the pinks, a little bit in the greens. But in the landscape anyway, most of your colors are somewhat grayed. So for traveling and sketching, those three colors get you a long way. And what they don't get you is um, beginners, you can mix dark darks with this, but beginners have a hard time. So I suggest they add uh, burnt sienna and ultramarine blue to get their range of grays. 
And this is another alternative um, palette for travel. This is Oriolan, Ultramarine Blue, and Burnt Sienna. And if you look at this, most people's reaction is, uh, you know, it doesn't, it's not as pretty as this sort of rainbow thing. Yes, that's true, but if you ask yourself the colors you need to mix for painting landscapes that you need over and over and over and over again, this has got, this gets you quickly to a lot of those colors. And then if you need a bright red, you can add one bright red. So here you have three colors. This will get you as dark as you need to go. You can go all the way to black with these two. And if you need a pure pink or a bright red or a bright turquoise for the location you're on, then add one or two colors. So with either this base palette or this base palette, um, you know, you can, with just a few colors, you can really go a long way. And then you can throw on a few other brighter colors or special colors that are your favorites. And I'm like, I always have to have turquoise on my palette. You know, it's got to be there. Whether I'm gonna use it in the painting or not, I just, you know, love turquoise. Yeah. But, um, and, and this palette actually, this one is overly complicated because there are colors on here for when I'm doing videos that I'm teaching where I restrict myself to the palette I recommend for my students. But because I work in acrylic, I actually use a different base palette myself so I can match my acrylic. So anyway, I've got like two base palettes on here. Mm -hmm. um, but I have this little teeny, teeny palette. This one, it has uh, 12 wells, but many of these wells have like, those are the same, those are the same, those, are, you know, I just fill them with the stuff I use over and over and over again. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, so there's eight colors in this 12 okay. color palette. Yeah. And and this cute little palette, by the way, is on the handout. So, you know, before somebody goes, where did you get that? That's adorable. <laughs> it is adorable. And the only reason I have it is that it's adorable and I fell for the marketing hype. But um, it, it's a it's a it's an artist up in Washington who uses this to sort of help supplement her travels. So it was for a good cause. Yeah, it would be nice for those extra colors that you might want to have a pop of red in there or the turquoise or whatever would be nice. Yeah, but you know, um, most travel palettes have at least eight wells. Okay. So if you start with these three plus ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, there's five. And that leaves you three more wells at least. So most of them have eight. Smallest ones are usually eight. Uh, many are 12. So that's plenty. You right. don't really need more than that to go right. to the field. And then, and, and, <laughs> go ahead. I was just gonna say, I'm, I'm not a good model of that. It's kind of frustrating because it's like, okay, but I either have to have a bunch of different palettes for different purposes, or I have more stuff on my palette than I use myself because a lot of the stuff that's on here is for teaching. And then students go, but you got 15 colors on your palette. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not painting with all 50. You saw about what I do, right? You know, I'm into what, four wells out of here today. Right. That's it. Yeah, I think that's what I was thinking. When you were doing your paintings, you seem to have the two basic colors that were dominant. And then you would work with those to come up with shades. So all of these, all three of these paintings were also painted with the same pigments that I use today. Okay. Actually only three of the four that I use today. So, you know, yeah, you can, I mean, because the thing is in the landscape, it, you only rarely need those really brilliant colors. Um, so if you're doing, you know, if you're going somewhere in the tropics and you know you're gonna have that turquoise water, then you throw in some turquoise. If you're going, to um, an arboretum where there's gonna be gardens and you want those bright pinks and stuff, then you throw that in. Um, and, and so you, you have room, if you have a base palette of, of five colors, you have room to add all those extras that you might need for either your favorites or special stuff. Right. So you were gonna ask a different question. I yeah, think. I had another question. <laughs> when you were showing your video of um, your travels, uh, there was a wave painting that was uh, looked like uh, cobalt and cerulean blue, maybe, and then you had um, it looked like ink 
um, in there with designs of some kind. So are you talking about the, let me get back to the, it was swirling waves. At the, at the very end? Yes. It's these guys over here, yeah. Oh, I, I'm they covered. Don't, I have the chat covering that. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and, and they don't show up very well behind me here because the um, sunlight coming in still is kind of blowing out the whites. Okay. But, yeah, this is, this is Are the, there designs drawn in those? Okay. It reminded me a lot of Native Northwestern art. That's interesting. I'm not aware of that influence, but um, you know, I was traveling through those areas. So this yeah. is one panel of that. Yeah, this is why I say, you know, I'm not sure how to say how the postcard paintings affect my own work stylistically. Um, it's more about how they affect how I think about, you know, choosing designs and so forth. I kind of changed the approach instead of going, how do I paint that? I ask, what can I do with what I know how to do right now? I'm still always trying to improve my skills too, but I also want to have success with the paintings I'm doing today. And I don't think I should have to wait until, especially I don't think students should have to wait until some magical future years from now when they have every technical skill they could possibly have to have a painting that's successful and satisfying. Mm -hmm. I think you can have that right at the beginning, but as someone else pointed out, we all, you know, get so fixated on learning techniques and perfecting techniques. And I'll just go watch six more YouTube videos. And um, one of the things the postcards taught me is that you don't have to have, you know, 60 jillion techniques in your back pocket to be able to do a painting. Uh, so the question is that watercolor or acrylic or both, it's both. I start in watercolor because watercolor does, you know, these really soft effects better. It's easier to control those than in acrylic. So this is all watercolor back here in the background. And then the, um, the really dark lines are acrylic because watercolor, after you've laid the wash and the sizing is off, it tends to feather a little bit so I can get a, a sharper line. And then obviously the white on top is acrylic too. Okay. Yeah, I was reading that as ink, but I can see now. Uh, well, it is, it is, uh, you could say it's ink. It's, it's a high flow acrylic, which is basically an acrylic ink. Okay. I, I'm using a dip pen for this and a very um, sharp pointed brushes. Let's see, where are they? I don't know. If, yeah, here we go. This is called a Menso brush. It's for doing uh, calligraphy. You can get them from Japan. They cost about three bucks. <laughs> okay. And they're basically um, like the tip of the water brushes, you know, the, the, the kind of tip that they right. have, that nylon tip. Right. It's basically the same thing, same kind of spring, except it's not a water brush. It's just a regular brush. Do That's you, what I use for all the- Do you use details. water brushes much when you're on site? When I'm traveling, yes, I do. Um, that's part of my like mini kit when I'm not, um, when I'm trying to just have what I can take in my pocket. So when I want to try, when I want to take the minimal possible, what I take is this. I take however many postcards I want. I take a pen. And again, there's a video about this that, that um, I've listed, I think, in the handout. I take a pen that has water-soluble ink. So I can draw with this pen, do my usual little ink drawings. So this is um, just a typical office style gel pen. This is a uniball gel pen, but most of the office gel pens do this. So try what you have in your house. So I draw my, you know, my lighthouse. We'll put it on more of a cliff. And then I take a water brush and because this is water soluble ink, I can move it with the water brush to pull out some shadowing. Mm -hmm. So I do that. And then when I'm working in my sketchbooks, very often it's the water brush and this little bitty palette because I can take the sketchbook and whatever page I'm working on, 
I take a binder clip, it's a smaller binder clip. I take a binder clip and so I can clip that little palette and use my water brush. And then all you need is, you know, that and the water brush and a, a towel to wipe the brush off on. So yeah, I use them, I use them in my sketchbook quite a bit. Not so much for postcards, um, even a postcard, except for this, but once I start getting up into uh, doing postcards in color, they're, they're too small, you know, they don't, they don't cover enough territory. Right. I, I do not, I'm not a big fan of small brushes. I like a, as big a brush as I can buy. This is a 12 travel brush. Um, mm -hmm. That's about as big as most of them come, that comes to a sharp point. So, mm -hmm. you know, as long as it comes to a sharp point, I only need one brush to do everything. Right. But um, for my sketchbooks where, you know, sometimes I'm just like adding a little bit of color to a line drawing, then yeah, I use the water brush for that. Okay, thank you. Um, Lauren asks, how many colors did you use on that abstract with the sharp angular lines? Um, let me see, where is that abstract? I think, let me look at it. Okay, so this one I assume is the one we're talking about. Yeah, I think so. So let's see, the colors on here, this was for a class where we were exploring colors. So there is phthalo blue, and I think it's just two. It's phthalo blue, I'm pretty sure it's phthalo blue and quin burnt sienna or quin burnt rust or something along those lines. Whatever this, this yellow, it's this orange here. That's pretty much the pure orange tone. Um, and that's the mask tone. So I think it's a quin burnt rust and phthalo blue, okay. so just two here. Wow. This was a complimentary color exercise. So, so yeah, it's interesting that they made kind of this green tone, Those that Quinn Rust has enough yellow in it apparently to, to make it, to read mm -hmm. as a green. Art, do you have any questions? Um, <clears throat> could you just tell us a little bit how you've progressed? Uh, I know you have some larger pieces. Uh, we talked about uh, some of the healthcare facilities in Minneapolis area that have those pieces. How you've progressed just briefly over the years uh, from either stylistically or subject matter or a combination of both? Uh, okay, let's see. Um, let me think about how to answer that question. So I, I started out, well, first of all, um, I think you said something about prior art training. I actually, I'm, I'm a self-taught artist. I had no prior art training. When I left Carleton in 2000, um, I, I had never done anything with art before. And I was one of those people that I had a year, uh, I thought between, I was kind of making a, a career shift and I had a year between jobs and I was going to be the stay-at-home mom for the first time in my life. And so I thought, uh, I'm going to play around with watercolor. That's been on my bucket list, you know. So um, I very, I was very fortunate that I went to the um, the Northfield Art Store, which has since changed hands. I don't know if it's still even open, but um, there was this like three week evening, three weekday evening class that wasn't a how to watercolor, it was kind of what to buy watercolor. So we had one class where they sort of showed us the difference and let us try out student grade and professional grade paint and student grade and professional grade uh, paper and different kinds of brushes. And, and so that was my introduction. And then, you know, I didn't know any better. I went home and just messed around with it for ages because it was just something I was doing for fun and I was kind of fascinated with it. And then um, I started, I, you know, reading books, so like there were no YouTube videos to watch back then, and it kind of took over my life. So um, <laughs> fast forward a couple of years, I started entering shows and started to sell my work. And I, I want to say it was 2000. So I started doing things like, you know, shows with uh, local arts organizations in coffee shops and banks and, you know, that kind of stuff. And then I decided I was going to, um, I, I wanna say it was 2003 that Hudson Hospital, the new hospital, what's now the new hospital in Hudson got built. 
and they were going to dramatically expand their healing arts program. And I thought that was, I was kind of involved with the FIPS. I thought that was a really cool thing. And I thought I was at the point where I wasn't really ready to, you know, to break into so showing my stuff professionally, but I was ready to start learning the process of making slides and writing an artist statement and everything. So they were su soliciting, and they still do this, by the way, if anybody is like really wanting to get into this healing arts stuff, when the FIPS does their call for their galleries, that call also serves as the call for all of the healthcare facilities now that they do healing arts programs for, which is a lot. I'm, I'm not even up on what it might be now, but it's uh, the Hudson Hospital, the New Richmond Hospital, and I think four, three or four at least, um, like uh, assisted living facilities of various sorts around the area. So they've got a lot, uh, they need a lot of work. Um, and I thought, well, I, I could probably do that. You know, so I submitted not really realizing that I was submitting for both. I was just trying to submit for the hospital. And um, so they invited me to show and that was like super exciting. Um, and then they contacted me about a month later and said, and by the way, um, we've selected you to show your work in the galleries. Thank goodness I had a year to, <laughs> to do some paintings for that because I had just started out and I was like, they, you have the 20 photos that I, that I would want to show to the rest of the world. Um, so, um, I actually showed something like 56 works and, um, yeah, at that, in that time, I was painting mostly larger paintings. Um, I preferred to work full sheet, um, or even larger. I had some that were, you know, larger than full sheet off of a roll. Um, and, and in the healing arts side of things, uh, a lot of the work that I did was large because, you know, in a corporate setting, a lot of times you have big facility big walls you need big so I would paint uh, paintings on you know from a roll a roll of paper and I mount my work on the cradled boards the deep two inch deep cradled boards so um, you know three by three board and then I do multi-panel work so um, you know there might the whole panel might it might be eight feet long by three feet tall on five different panels or something like that um, when I moved out to the Oregon coast, most of the uh, healing arts stuff there and here and everywhere is restricted. You know, it's grant money and they want somebody who's living in the local area. And I have not sort of reestablished myself. I started doing more teaching by Zoom and I kind of got diverted into that. And I haven't gotten back into this area's healing arts movement um, then I took off in the van, you know, there's been, been a bunch of life interruptions. So this work is, you know, headed in that direction. I'm thinking, you know, I will pitch it, but I'm not doing it right now. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I have always painted stuff, you know, out in the field, this postcard size stuff and the little bitty paintings. I've always painted those little paintings, but for a long time, I didn't show anybody them because for me, it was the first step on the way to something more abstract. And you get all this advice about you should only have one style that you show, and you know. And finally, I thought, you know what? I'm painting these little paintings anyway. They're step one. They're like thumbnail sketches to me, you know. Step one. But people love them. I had, so I had these little. It, it started with the tiny escapes, actually, not postcards. But so I was doing these little bitty paintings on. Um, so so this is the beginning of that painting that I showed you, that acrylic painting. This is where I start. I sat on the beach and I watched the waves break over and over and over again for like two years, you know, trying to extract what is the thing that's fascinating to me about this wave. What do I want my abstract work to look like? But that involved doing a lot of realistic work. And I had these all sitting on my mantelpiece and people would come over and go, oh my gosh, those are so cute. Do you ever sell those? And I'm like, no, those are like my field studies. And finally, I thought, well, why not sell the ones that turn out? I mean, they don't all turn out nice. Some of them are terrible. I wouldn't show to anybody, but, you know, why not? Um, so I started doing that. And when I'm teaching, most people, I think, like I did, you start with the more realistic approach. And then you have to figure out, like, what, what draws you? What are your you know, favorite ways to make marks and favorite ways to represent things. And 
you evolve from there. So when I'm teaching, you know, what my students want to know how to do is how do I make it look like clouds? How do I make it look like waves? And so I do a lot of this in my teaching too. Mm -hmm. But um, my, you know, more serious work, what I consider the end product is that, you know, crazier acrylic stuff. But I can't get, I, I can't go straight there. I don't, I, you know, I know some people can, but for me to do, I'll do it back on here. To get to here, what I had to do was watch waves enough to realize that what I wanted to do with these paintings, and this is, there's two here, so, you know, it carries forward. I wanted your eye to move the way the water moves. So all these little lines that are, you know, moving, it's not supposed to look like a wave. It's supposed to make your eye move like a wave moves. So this was, you know, like my attempt to how do I capture that movement in some other way than just sort of um, rendering it directly the way it would look like if you took a photograph with a slow shutter speed or something. You know, I didn't want to just blur it to show motion. I wanted the motion to occur in a different way. And so this is where I am currently with it, is showing that motion by getting your eye to move that way. And actually I've watched people stand in front of these and um, not only does their eye move that way, they move their bodies that way. So I'm like, okay, I think I'm headed in the right direction here. <laughs> but, you know, and then other people are like, that's stu super weird. Why don't you show me how to paint a real breaking wave? <laughs> so, you know, not everybody likes every style, but that's okay. So when you created Dragonfly Spirit Studios, what is it in the Dragonfly that... <laughs> Really? Oh, so, so like many people, I've been fascinated with dragonflies since I was a little kid. And that was totally an accident. Um, when I was first painting, I was doing lots of little insects. Um, and I was having fun painting dragonflies because there's, so you can see the beginnings of my fascination with all this line work and this mark yeah. breaking, you know, it's like, that's like dragonfly wings, insect wings. I, so I love making that kind of mark obviously. And so um, <laughs> I started doing dragonflies because I liked the mark making involved and I was doing a bunch of them. And so people started going, oh, you're the dragonfly lady. <laughs> so I thought when I was trying to figure out a studio name, I didn't, I, I actually had my website under my name, which is a problem because both my first name and my last name are the uncommon spelling. Right. And there is a Lynn B-A-U-E-R. She's a wildlife photographer in California. Yeah. And she was constantly getting, you know, people going, well, where are all the watercolors? Where are your classes? Where are you going to blah, 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 blah. So I thought, okay, I got to have something besides my name because people misspell it. And then they wind up at her website and drive her crazy. So I thought, well, everybody knows me as a dragonfly lady. So I'll just use something with dragonfly. And dragonfly studio was taken. So... Um, you know, when you go looking for a domain name, it suggests other possibilities. And it was one of the things that was suggested. And I thought, oh, that'll work. Now I kind of regret it because it's I have to type it all the time. <laughs> it's like super long. <laughs> it's like, can yes, I yes. pick something shorter? <laughs> There's a couple of other questions from members and a comment. Let's see. Um, your waves could definitely be considered healing art. Your waves are gorgeous and how cool oh, thank you. it affects viewers physically as well as visually. I love that too. And then Linda asks, how does your background in mathematics affect your art? <laughs> so everybody always says, um, wow, you know, going from math to art, that's a huge jump. You know, it's like left brain, like right brain. And um, that's a myth. So um, accounting to art would maybe be that huge jump. But if you go to a math conference, so, so you're at a conference with research mathematicians who uh, are just getting to know each other and you're standing around talking and one mathematician says to another, so what do you do in your research? The first thing out of everybody's mouth is, let me draw you a picture. Most mathematicians work very visually. Um, I mean, eventually we have to get down to the nitty gritty of writing down a proof to make sure that what we're imagining actually mm -hmm. really holds up in all situations. But most people who do mathematics do it in the visual part of their brains. So I, to me, it's like all of a piece. It, it's like, I'm just using the same part of my brain that I've always used. 
Um, and I don't think that I am more, I mean, I, I personality wise, I have the personality where I like do like doing the little detail work that some people would find like excruciatingly boring, but not all the time, you know, I mean, I like to be, I start, you know, there's paint running down my arms and, you know, big messes all over the place. I start with pouring and spraying and, you know, and then this stuff gets layered on top of it. But um, I, I don't, I don't know that the mathematics comes in in any direct way, but I can tell you that it feels the same internally. It feels like I'm using the same parts of my brain to, to do a painting as it does to do mathematics, to come up with an, a theorem and try to prove it, you know? So I don't know. <laughs> and, um, Juliet has a fun question for your travels. In your travels to the Pacific Northwest, did you stop in Humboldt, Arcata? or Arcada. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. No, I didn't. Okay. And then a new message just came in. Musicians also are phys physicians often. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, this whole right brain, left brain thing kind of got debunked anyway. Most of us use our, our whole brains for lots of things, but um, artists and mathematicians, the big crossover. Mm -hmm. Into um, mu I found in my teaching that um, a lot of the music teachers I work with are very into math also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's all pattern recognition. Yes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, I think those are all the questions and there's some wonderful comments. Lynn, it's been wonderful. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Well, thank you. I've, I've certainly enjoyed, I, I wish I wish I could like hang out and, and visit because right. I know there are probably some people out there that I haven't seen in a while, but maybe by, well, I'm not going to be able to travel this summer, but maybe by next year, I'll be back on the road. Yeah, um, stop in for one of our meetings sometime. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. I'd hopefully, like you guys meet through the summer too, right? No, no. Oh. We take the summer off. And oh, do you? Yeah. Oh, okay. We have somehow had I had it that you took the winter well, off. We're going to have an online meeting in June, which is kind of a departure from what we've done in the past. Yeah. But uh, July and August we're off. So. Right. I'd like to ask our members or our guests to unmute themselves and let's give Lynn a rousing cheer for Hey, oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I will give thank you a handout to Deirdre. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> you'll Perfect. have that. <laughs> yes, I will. Um, for all the members who are still with us, I, I will, um, see about getting the handout uh, and the links posted on our website and Facebook and uh, see if we can include them in the summary I do for the newsletter. Oh, cool. And you. that will also include the YouTube link to view this video later. <laughs> if I didn't bore you enough the first time. Oh, no way. I'm no. going back and in, in detail looking at those yes. leaves again. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you. And get out there and paint po postcards and have fun. <laughs> we will. Thank you. The weather's getting nice. It's time to, to go out and play in the field. Yes, it oh, is. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I've had a wonderful time. Thanks. Thank you. Good Thank night you. Now. Good night, all. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.